Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure on the behalf of the trustees and the staff and the volunteers of the Computer History Museum to welcome you to the 31st year of our fellow awards. This started back in 1987 by our predecessor organization, the Computer Museum in Boston, when we inducted Grace Murray Hopper, the admiral and the admirable Grace Murray Hopper is the first fellow of the Computer Museum. Our goal, as always, is to make heroes out of technologists, to put them on a pedestal, to celebrate their achievements, and to make role models of them. Now, choosing the fellows is always a difficult process, and I want to acknowledge the group of people who do that, the jury. It's composed of trustees and staff members and outside advisors and former fellows as well. I want to particularly call out the not-so-anonymous Dag Spicer, who is our senior curator who keeps us all in line, and Cynthia holiday Loosely, who does all of the logistics and makes the process work. Thank you. By the way, the nominations are public, so if there are people you think that ought to be fellows who aren't yet, uh, go to the website, computerhistory.org slash fellows, and submit a nomination or convince somebody you know to submit a nomination. That's the way this happens. If you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, I want to talk a little bit about my personal history with computers and computing. It turns out that I'm almost exactly as old as the computer is. Now, <laughs> bear with me. Now, I know how old I am because I have a birth certificate. The computer it's a little more difficult because depending on what you mean, it could be 2,000 years old or it could be 50 years old. Our former head curator, Mike Williams, used to say, it depends on what adjectives you put in front of the noun. So if you choose the following adjectives, electronic, general purpose, and software controlled, then most textbooks will tell you that the birth date of the computer is June 21st, 1948. That was the day when a prototype computer called the Baby at the University of Manchester in England ran a 17-line program for the first time. On that date, I was minus three weeks old. <laughs> now, a couple of years ago, I actually talked about some recent research that says that the ENIAC computer developed at the University of Pennsylvania ran software about two or three months earlier than that in a much more complicated program. But look, we're splitting hairs. Whether I was minus three weeks or minus three months old doesn't really matter. I'm the same age as the computer. Now, we grew up separately, not knowing about each other. <laughs> and we met when we were both 12 years old. Sorry, 13 years old. And where that meeting was, was in New York City, in the basement of a four-story brownstone building on the campus of Columbia University, which was, at the time, the IBM Watson Research Lab. And they had a program where public school kids could come visit the IBM, three, uh, the IBM 650 vacuum tube computer in the basement and learn what computers did. I think this was a program encouraged by the mayor of the city of New York because he didn't want kids to become what was called JDs, juvenile delinquents, right, at the time. Now, I was the least likely person to be walking around the street with a switchblade knife uh, uh, threatening people. But there I was learning about computers, and I got to see how they work and write my first program. Now, it won't surprise people who know me that I still have that first program. <laughs> that, that I wrote 57 years ago. This is machine language for the IBM 650 computer. I have no idea what this does <laughs> or was supposed to do. But, but what I do know is that I became mesmerized with the idea that you could write this abstract code and it could be used to control this enormous machine. And that machine was doing something that seemed to me akin to thinking. You were writing code that was making a machine think. That experience that weekend changed my life. I knew that day what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I'm still doing it. 57 years later, I'm still designing circuits and writing software and uh, enjoying myself doing it. Now, so what's the point of this story? 
That experience was in my mind when 23 years ago I had the crazy notion that I wanted to start a computer museum and eventually teamed up with the people who had done the computer museum in Boston and moved it to California. But the idea of creating a life-changing event is what the museum does. That's what our exhibits do. That's what our events do. And in particular, that's what our education programs do. Many of them are focused on that age group. They're focused on middle school people, middle school kids, to try to inspire them and get them to decide what they want to do for the rest of their lives. Our focus these days is particularly on girls. There, as far as I can recall, were no girls in the basement that weekend learning about the IBM 650. And guess what? 12% of the computer engineers in the world are women. 12%. That's ridiculous. And it's women undergraduate majors peaked in 1985 at 35% and have been decreasing since. It's down now to about 19%. Those of you from Stanford should be proud because Stanford actually does a better job. So we need these life-changing experiences to be able to get more young people and particularly more women and minorities to be involved in computing. They also need role models. Now there are some role models, particularly for girls, like Grace Hopper, our first uh, fellow like Ada Lovelace, who's downstairs in an exhibit that we, where we talk about her collaboration with Babbage on the machine that would have been the first computer had he built it, which he didn't. But there are others. I just learned recently about one I had known nothing about, and I suspect you don't either. Her name is Ida Rhodes. She was born in 1900. She was born in Eastern Europe. Her name at the time was Hadassah Iskowitz. She came to this country with her parents at the age of 13. Came to this country. By the way, all three of our fellows this year crossed international boundaries to do the amazing work that they did. It seems to me that if the effect of porous borders and immigration is that kind of work, we should be doing more of that, not less of that. But that's the subject of a different talk. So Ida Rhodes came here in 1913 and went to Cornell and Columbia University, became a mathematician. Before the computer was born, she was a human computer, one of these people that used a desk calculator to do calculations in mathematics. After the computer was born and she began to use it, she became a software engineer. She worked on the design of programming languages. Uh, she did early software to translate Russian to English and English to Russian. In 1952, she wrote a remarkable paper that we have just republished on the web. Look it up on our website. It was called The Human Computer's Dreams of the Future. It's not a technical paper, but it's an inspiring paper. She describes the same kind of awe that I would feel 11 years later. She said, every improvement about computers fills me with the same delight, amazement, and gratitude which I felt when I first had the joy of using this brainchild of electronic engineers. The future developments in this field will be stupendous, and I envy all who have the opportunity of taking an active part in them. She, as I was entranced with the notion of what these machines could do. She prognosticated about the future. Remember, these were the days when computers were huge and filled rooms. She said, I like to think of the day when one day these precious toys would be sitting on my desk so that I would not have to go down on my knees begging for a few minutes use of the computer. She also talked about wall-sized computer video screens, about digital art, about optical character recognition, about server farms and, and more. It's a remarkable paper, you should look it up. She talked about the human computer interface and she bemoaned the fact that we have to translate the computer's binary code into the decimal code, the base 10 code that we're familiar with. And she said, I cannot suppress my regret that the good Lord had seen fit in his wisdom to endow us with 10 fingers rather than eight. <laughs> I don't know how, what that would mean for typing, but 
look, okay, maybe she got a little carried away about re-engineering the computer to m match the human body rather than the other way around, but, <laughs> but she was a remarkable person, and she is a worthy role model. So there are all sorts of role models around if we look hard enough for them. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for supporting the museum and helping us look for role models. And how, thank you for being here to honor the three role models that we will make fellows tonight. If we keep doing this, we will change the lives of some 13-year-olds. And that's an important thing to do. Now, Now comes something that I only get to do about once every eight or ten years, and that is to introduce a new CEO of the Computer History Museum. Before I do that, I need to give a big round of thanks and applause to Steve Smith. Steve Smith is a trustee who volunteered to be the interim CEO while we were searching for our new CEO. And I'm particularly gra gra grateful to what he did because last time around, I had to do it. And this time, <laughs> he took me off the hook and did a much better job. So thank you, Steve, for what you did. <laughs> that eight months gives us the chance, gave us the chance to find what the spouse of one of our trustees called the best person on the planet to lead the Computer History Museum. Dan Lewin is an industry veteran. He worked for the computer division of Sony, for Apple, for Next, for Go Corporation, for a startup called Origin, and for the last 17 years was the key executive of Microsoft in the Valley. Dan knows everyone. He reads voraciously, he thinks big, He's been on the job only seven weeks and is off to a great start, filled with all sorts of wonderful ideas about how we can build on our success. We are delighted and excited to have him as our new CEO. Please welcome Dan Lewin. Well, that was terrific. Thank you, Lan. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I am almost as old as the computer. Um, I'd like to start by saying how delighted I am that what we have here tonight in the audience are people who are legends, people who are leaders, uh, people who are inventors and innovators, and people who created companies and technologies that have changed the world. I think given that it's Saturday night, I'm going to consider this the technical equivalent of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Because you're all here, and this is the Computer History Museum. <laughs> I've had a wonderful opportunity over the last 40 plus years to be in this industry. And uh, I will say that I was there in Boston uh, when the museum first opened. Um, and I really had no idea what was going on. I had just started. Um, and I think at the end of the day, no one had any idea where we would be today. Although I think this paper that Len just described is the one that we all need to read. From my standpoint, it was really the beginning of a long and really exciting road. When I first met Len, I've known Donna for as long as, as, as I've been in this business. We started at Apple pretty much the same week. Um, but when I met Len, he took me over to Moffett Field where the archive was. So we'll thank Gordon Bell for his work and everything in Boston, and then the archive moved out here. And at that time, I was more or less, you can do the math, in my 40s. And my question to Len was, who cares? Because I was so caught up in what I was doing in the moment that I really wasn't paying attention to what was really happening. And that is that computers were just enveloping our lives. And I was part of it, but I didn't see it the way I see it today. And as I took my break from leaving Microsoft, I knew about a year ago that I was going to leave. And in the fall, I, I ended up off payroll, and I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. And this opportunity was presented, and 
frankly speaking, I'd spent the last four years focused on the implications of public-private partnerships and computing on society. And the fact that this institution has the definitive collections, has the support of all of you, a trustee collection and a trustee community that is benevolent, as well as filled with ideas and operating strategies about what can be done, it was just absolutely a dream come true. So when I look to the future, given the foundation of what's here, and I look to the core purpose statement of the institution to explore the computing revolution and the impact on the human experience, and I think to myself, well, it's been 40 plus years that I've been doing this, so I guess I've seen history happen. So let's interpret it. Let's do our best to interpret it and have it presented to everyone on the planet, because there isn't a person alive that isn't touched by this today. And this is the place from which all the ideas come forward. So it's an incredibly exciting time for me to be here. And this celebration tonight is really a celebration of the spirit and the power of possibility. And it's really the beginning of the legacy of technology and all of the things that will come to the future. And embedded in this collection that we have are spirits and ideas and promise of how technology will change everyone's lives. And at this wonderful evening, I've been to several in the past, we have a chance to honor the remarkable contributions of three people. And these journeys are exceptional. I'd like to begin by referencing Dove Froman Benchkowski, who while working as an engineer at Intel in the 1970s, invented the first commercially available programmable read-only memory, the EEPROM. It's a memory device that enables programmers to quickly update that code. I'm not sure I need to explain that to this audience, but I'll say it nonetheless, because there may be a few people who don't fully understand. In the 1960s, Dame Shirley, excuse me, Dame Stephanie Shirley, I've confused that one all week as I've looked at it, recognized both the lack of professional opportunities for women caring for families and an underrepresentation of women in the computing industry. In 1962, Shirley founded Freelance Programmers, a UK company that trained and offered women who had left the workforce gainful employment as programmers. And from 1962 to 1975, the company grew and employed 300 programmers. 297 of them were women. All right. So someone was paying attention to Len's comments, and, and I will offer Len credit for the fact that she is the first fellow to be a dame and a fellow. So there you go. <laughs> or maybe that's Humphrey Bogart. I'm not really sure. Guido Van Rossum changed the foundation of software development with his 1991 creation of the Python programming language that helps compose applications from machine learning to banking to company giants like Microsoft and Google and others that rely almost exclusively on many of their application and underlying work. They rely on Python. With that, I'd like to move on before we move into dinner and thank the sponsors. I'd like to thank Accenture, who's been a sponsor for the fifth year and award for the fellow program. So let's thank Accenture. And tonight, you'll hear from the museum trustee and Accenture's chief technology and chief innovation officer, Paul Doherty. He'll be on stage later this evening. I'd like to move on and thank sponsors Intel and Dropbox. Intel has every right to be proud tonight, sponsoring Dove and his special work around the EEPROM, and the award will be presented by Intel fellow Al Fazio. Also, Dropbox CEO Drew Houston will be presenting the award to one of his personal heroes, Guido Van Rossum. Next, I'd like to join me in thanking Intel, and special thanks to Intel's Aline Fagan, who will be presenting the award tonight to Stephanie Shirley. Pardon me? Into it. Did I say that? Oh, my mistake. Int 
you know that's 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 really my bad because I'm 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 friends with Scott. <laughs> Oops. Uh, well, now they're going to get a little extra air cover now. So let's thank into it. All right, everybody. <laughs> And tonight, uh, unfortunately, Stephanie, Dame Stephanie Shirley won't be able to be here tonight. Traveling is a little too difficult at this stage. But accepting the award in her honor is a close friend of hers, Roberta Distachio. And she'll be accepting the award tonight. So thank you for that. OK, as we move on, I'd like to thank Microsoft on behalf of being a sponsor for the films this evening. And also a large number of gala sponsors that you see on the slide today. Terrific to see this kind of support for the institution. And then finally, a special thanks to the trustees, some of whom are here tonight sponsoring tables, and many others of you who have been participating and supporting the museum over the years. So that really sums things up with one major exception, and that is to thank Peggy Burke and 1185 Design, who for the last 16 years has provided support for the design work for this event. So let's thank. Peggy in 1185. And as you all know, events like this don't happen without staff and volunteers. So this museum is fortunate to have an incredible staff and an incredible collection of volunteers, some of whom are here tonight. So I want to appreciate and thank them as well if you'll join me. And this program and all of the others would not be what they are if it weren't for the Lifetime Giving Society members and the core circle donors, many of whom are here tonight. And with that, let's all honor the class of 2018, and we'll move on to the next session of our program, and then we'll begin the awards presentation. Thanks very much. What a wonderful evening. Are you all having a great time tonight? I think the team just does a fantastic job putting on this event, and uh, it's been over 30 years of Fellows Awards for the museum, and uh, we've been really pleased for the last five years to be a headline sponsor for the, for the Fellows Award on behalf of myself and my company, Accenture. And we do this because the Computer History Museum is really a special place and an important place. And if you step back and think about it, as uh, Len and Daniel said earlier, we live in amazing times in the midst of an incredible technology revolution that's changing and reshaping you know, the, the world in which we work and live. And uh, you know, I can see a slice of that in my own business at Accenture, which is, which is why places like the museum are so important. You know, we're doing work in my business like helping farmers use drones and video analytics to farm more effectively, produce food more effectively with less use of the planet's resources. We're doing work with pharmaceutical companies using technologies like, uh, like uh, deep learning and GPU processing to bring drugs to market more quickly and, and solve medical issues for patients more quickly. We're doing work for refugees who are stranded in forward, foreign lands using technologies like blockchain and biometric technology to give people back their identity and give them access to the social services and recognition in society that they need. And this is just a small fraction of the potential that we have in technology, and that's represented by the potential of all the technology that we showcase here at the Computer History Museum, and that's represented in the innovations that the fellows develop. So when I think about the Computer History, you know, Computer History Museum, it's about the stories in the past and the history that's here, and I love all that, and I'm a history geek, so it means a lot to me to see all that, but it's also about interpreting the present and then understanding and shaping the future, leveraging all the technology that we've seen, which is why, to me, the mission of the museum really is special, and this really is a, a special place. And so with that, I'd really just like to you know, let, let us uh, move on with the evening and uh, maybe make two final points. The first is congratulations to this year's fellows another outstanding group of fellows to add to the list. And, and thanks to all of you. Again, as I said, hopefully, it, hopefully you've seen this. This is a special place. It requires, you know, it requires a, a broad group and a broad community to make the museum work. And thanks to all of you who are attending, who are donating, who are supporting, who are working for the museum in any way. And uh, let's get on with the evening and have a great time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our first honoree is being recognized tonight for his invention of the EEPROM, the Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory, a groundbreaking invention that promoted the rapid development of computer systems. In the late 1960s, several conceptual ideas and laboratory demonstrations arose in pursuit of creating semiconductor non-volatile memories. None of those devices found commercial success. Soon after Intel Corporation was formed, Duff Froman joined the new company to work on, guess what? The development of a semiconductor non-volatile memory. Initially, Duff's work focused on the use of charge storage in a film of silicon nitride. Duff soon discovered that there were major trade-offs between the data retention time and write speed that left little room for a successful engineering compromise. He shifted his work to exploring a mysterious gate charging phenomena in MOS transistors. By constructing floating gates buried in silicon oxide, he was able to demonstrate very long retention times and to understand the underlying physics. With this understanding of the physics of the new floating gate device, he went on to develop the EEPROM and introduced it at the 1971 IEEE Solid State Circuits Conference. Previous read-only memory chips were programmed at a great expense in a remote factory with long lead times. Intel's new 1702 EEPROM ushered in a revolution in how computer systems were prototyped, dramatically reducing the time it took designers and software developers to perfect their systems. Intel's co-founder Gordon Moore called it, quote, as important in the development of the microcomputer industry as the microprocessor itself. For many years, EEPROMs were a very important product in Intel's history, generating a major fraction of the company's profit. There's a little known fact that Intel may not have survived to transform into a microprocessor company had it not been the, for the EEPROM. At one point in the history of the EEPROM uh, of Intel, the EEPROM contributed more than 130% of Intel's total profits. Modern flash memory can trace its history directly back to Dove's floating gate device. <clears throat> e squared PROMs, NOR, and NAND flash memory are all direct descendants of the EEPROM. Today, Intel's solid state drives, which just achieved uh, its first billion dollar uh, quarterly revenue, based upon non volatile semiconductor memory using floating gate storage, is ushering in a revolution in data centers and promoting rapid development in computing systems, much like its ancestor, the EEPROM, did four plus decades ago. Tonight, we honor Dove and present a short film of his contributions to computing. I was born in Amsterdam and when the Germans started invading uh, Holland, my parents uh, gave me to, uh, to the underground. I, I went into a, uh, into a family that had uh, four kids, two daughters and two sons. I was uh, basically hiding there uh, all this period of time while the Germans were doing searches and stuff like that. After the war, the, the Jewish Brigade decided to uh, get me out of Allah. They tore me out of a, of a family that I, uh, that I knew, that I enjoyed. That, and so uh, it was a very hard transition. Then in 1949, I think, we took the boat to, uh, to Israel. When I went to Technion, uh, I I studied electrical engineering. When I graduated, I started looking for, before I graduated, started looking for, uh, for places to go to and uh, got uh, intrigued by Berkeley. There was a free speech movement, there was People's Park. Yeah, these are things that really uh, impact on you for a long time. The EEPROM really was the first manufacturable and saleable non-volatile device that uh, you could program electrically and then 
uh, take the power off the device and the storage, uh, the stored information will stay there. I had to sell it myself to go to customers and convince them that uh, the charge will stay there for a long time. That was really a, a breakthrough, a, a major breakthrough for Intel because this was a product that opened up a whole gamut of uh, interest. And Intel basically made a lot of money on it. My, my love with Africa was started in Berkeley. I went to, uh, to teach at uh, University of Science and Technology in Ghana, in Kumbas, Kumasi. When I was about to, uh, to leave Ghana, I went back to, to Intel. And, uh, and then I started convincing everybody that uh, it would be a good idea to set up a development center in Israel. Yeah, and we set up Intel Israel in July 74. Intel Israel is really was in many ways a founder of the Israeli high-tech industry. Right now, what I can tell you for uh, as a positive is uh, for the next generation is education, education, education. Less work, 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 and uh, yeah, and, and let's let's uh, listen to the important people in the past that already told us all we need to know, and we just ignore them. The 2018 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Dove Froman for the invention of the first commercial erasable programmable read-only memory, the EEPROM, which enabled rapid development of microprocessor-based system. Please join me in, wel in welcoming Dove to the stage. Thank you very much for this award. I really appreciate it. And uh, in return, I'll tell you two, two anecdotes from the first days of an EEPROM. First one was when we had the concept all firmed up. We is uh, basically Les Vadez, who is here and was my boss at the time, and myself. Uh, we decided we needed a uh, management meeting to decide what to do with the, pro with the, with the concept. And uh, I brought a, uh, a kludge of 16 TO5 cans. Uh, most of you know what TO5 cans are, but they would be ridiculous today as a demonstration. In fact, I would be thrown out of the room this is a TO5 can to whoever can see that far. But we had 16 of those with lights. And when we programmed, the light would come on. And when we erased all of the 16 bits, they all went off. And that was our uh, demo. <laughs> and uh, based on that demo, I had the audacity of uh, proposing that we go ahead <laughs> and develop a 2048-bit uh, electrically programmable and erasable memory. And there was complete quiet in the room, <laughs> a lot of skepticism, and everybody turned back to Gordon Moore, who was sitting in the corner, <laughs> very quiet. And when everybody looked at him, inimitably to Gordon, he took a few seconds to think about it, and he said, let's do it. <laughs> the second anecdote is uh, a bit later when we had the product. It was a 1601. <laughs> it was working. <laughs> And uh, uh, I was 
a little bit concerned. In fact, I, wanted, I was going in the hall in Mountain View in the facility, and uh, I encountered uh, Bob Noyes. Bob Noyes, in, order, in addition to all his other superlatives, was a people person. And so he looked at me and he said, Dov, you look very preoccupied this morning. What is the matter? And I said, uh, well, yeah, I, I have, there is a problem because uh, we have this product. We can erase it with x-rays, but it's not a very reliable method. And it occurred to me that it would be much better to do it with ultraviolet light. But in order to do it with ultraviolet light, we have to put a quartz lid on the package, which would mean that all the production people as a group will come and uh, basically throw me out of the building. <laughs> and uh, uh, Bob looked at me and he says, why not? And this has been a motto to my life since then. <laughs> but uh, I didn't lose any time. I went, went immediately to Andy's office, was then uh, director of operations, and of course in charge of production. And uh, uh, Andy used to say that uh, the problem with Dove is that if you don't let him through the door, he will come through the window. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I didn't come through the window, but I waited patiently, and I went into his office and said, uh, we, that's what we need to do in order to make the product viable. And when I sensed that he was about to throw me out of the office, I said, in the last minute, I said, but I talked to Bob Noyes. And he, he thought it was not a bad idea. <laughs> and so, uh, of course, the result was the 1702 with the quartz window that Intel, that Intel sold for four years making this product until, of course, there, was, there were advancement, and so, the rest, of, of course, is uh, history. And again, I thank you very much. I am so thrilled to be able to honor our next honoree, Dame Stephanie Shirley. Dame Stephanie is being honored tonight for her role in the creation of a pioneering all-woman programming company in the early 1960s, think about that, the early 1960s, and for a lifetime of promoting computing in the UK. Her story starts in World War II as well, where young Stephanie Shirley was un an unaccompanied child ref refugee, an experience that deeply affected her adult life. As a young woman trained in math and physics, she started a company in 1962 called Freelance Programmers in the UK. It was built intentionally to be of women and for women. At that time, women were widely viewed as unsuitable for technical work. In the early years, she even had to take and use the name Steve so that people would respond to her letters. Shirley's goal was to tap into a vast reservoir of women, often who were at home caring for their young children, who had some spare time and actually had the skills to incorporate programming into their daily lives. By 1975, the company had 300 employees and all but three were women. All but three were women back in 19, early 1960s. She was so far ahead of her time. 
Shirley sold much of her interest in the company to staff and it went public in 1996. She has since devoted her life to supporting IT projects such as the Oxford Internet Institute. And currently she directs all of her time in philanthropy to support re research into autistic spectrum disorders. Tonight, we honor Dame Stephanie Shirley and present a short film where she shares her contributions to computing. Early trauma affects a person and affects their life. Um, I was an unaccompanied child refugee um, and that experience has really driven my life. Uh, it is as strong today as it was 75 years ago. I, I became really very conscious that my, uh, how lucky I was to be, to be saved from Nazi Europe, um, how um, fortunate I was compared with a million and a half children who were killed during that time, um, and made me very uh, driven. Um, each day has got to be worthwhile. I've got to do something better today than I did yesterday. I became a learning person. I'm a perfectionist. I think all these things stem from the insecurity of a traumatic childhood. The shortage of money certainly drove me to sort of say, I'm going to get into work, I'm going to be self-contained, I'm going to earn my own money. And so I went for a job as a sort of junior mathematical clerk but in a very fine place. It was the post office research station, um, a very fine quality. Um, there were about 200 graduates there, um, quite a reputation worldwide. And so I started right at the bottom there and loved it. Because I'm so marketing oriented, you will expect me to sort of say that the private sector was more uh, female friendly. Um, in fact, I found it was the public sector because it was all structured and rules so that nobody could sort of say I couldn't do this if the rule book said that I could. Um, in my generation of women, there were lots of things that you couldn't do. Um, my job actually would have entailed me going onto a, a cable laying ship and I couldn't do that. Women just did not go on working ships. I could write software for the London Stock Exchange, but I couldn't actually work there myself. My business was very special. It was a woman's company in the computer industry. My company was originally called Freelance Programmers. 297 of the first 300 staff were all women. I mean, it was really a female-friendly organization. It was set up as a, as a crusade rather than to make money, and indeed it took a long time before it did make any money. And I was very proud eventually of when it succeeded that I'd set up this special woman's company. This is what we remember, this is how we recruited, this is what we were. An early project was to um, develop software standards, sort of management control protocols, and eventually those standards were adopted by NATO. Um, another big one was for black box flight recorder for supersonic Concorde. Programming began to be synonymous with, with coding, and so we moved to include systems analysis, set up a new company that just did systems and consultancy and started moving up there. So much of one's life is spent working that when it is a joy and a pleasure, I could never believe that I should be paid so well for doing something that I enjoyed so much. And that's how work should be, and it can be in the technical world. The 2018 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Dame Stephanie Shirley for a lifetime of entrepreneurship promoting the growth of the UK software industry and advancement of women in computing. Unfortunately, Dame Stephanie could not be with us this evening, but here to accept the award on her behalf is her very close friend, Roberta Estacio. going to love that. 
Um, Steve, I think I call Dame Stephanie Steve uh, because that is her name. Um, and um, she is so honored to be honored by you all. Um, she's in her middle 80s. Her husband's 95 and doing very, very well. But to get on an airplane to come out here, which she wanted to do so desperately, she just really couldn't do it. But she knows that, if, you know, Roberta, will you do this for me, please? Because she knows that she's here with me, okay? And I'll be able to tell her all the incredible people that have been here tonight and the things that you've said about her, those of you who have known her. Um, I will communicate that to her, and she will be so happy. She will be so happy. And soon, um, you might have seen that book in the film called Let It Go. She wrote that about a few years ago, and Hollywood came along. They found her too, and they are making a full-length feature film. And get that story. And get her story out everywhere, you know? Um, because, I'm sorry, the first person who talked tonight about women, um, I thought that was really great. But now we have, we have to, we need those models, and those models have to be out there. And it should just be, you know, like, yeah, she's a woman, so what, you know? She's running a company. Um, huh. The one thing when I first met her, and I met her 20 years ago, we were both on the BBC together. I was in New York and she was in London. And we didn't know each other yet, but as soon as I heard her talking, and she said, as soon as I, she heard me talking, that we had to like, be together and really get to know each other. So next time I was in London, we did, and we've been working together ever since. She's also highly invested, she invests in women's companies. She's invested in mine over the many years. And that's another big, need in this, in this community. Um, the one thing that really got to me when I met her is she said that when she first started the company, when she had to go to the bank, like in the late 50s, maybe early 1960, her husband had to sign the permission for her to open a business account, okay? And I thought, I thought that was crazy, but she did it and even if her husband didn't sign it, of course he did, she would have figured out a way to get it done. And that's her. She works and works and works and works, and she never stops. And um, I have learned so much from her. And I, again, I thank you so, so much. And I will tell her everything about you all. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight to honor one of my personal heroes. Uh, almost 30 years ago, Guido Van Rossum created a new programming language that was revolutionary in its simplicity and design. It was as easy to read as plain English, yet powerful enough to handle just about anything you could throw at it and underpin some of the world's most complex IT systems. He called it Python as a tribute to the comedic genius of Monty Python. <laughs> and since then, uh, it's become one of the essential building blocks of the digital world. So every time you do a search on Google, or you check Instagram, or share a file on Dropbox, <laughs> you owe a debt of gratitude to this unassuming uh, Dutch engineer who made his innov innovation free and open to the world. Uh, so I first discovered Python as an undergraduate at MIT, a computer science student. Um, and when I found it, I was like, oh my god, I guess this must be what it feels like for uh, a musician or a violinist to pick up a Stradivarius or for, for a chef to discover the perfect knife. Um, I, can't, I, I can't cook, but I, like, that's like what I imagine it to be like. <laughs> um, but it was so intuitive and it was so beautifully designed. And it showed incredible empathy for its users, the developers. And it always just worked. And a lot of these attributes really inspired my co-founder, Arash, and me when we thought about the design ethos for Dropbox. And there's no question that, quite literally, Dropbox would not exist without Python. Uh, it gave our little, our little startup superpowers. 
And choosing Python as our language allowed us to move, to outmaneuver our competitors, to accomplish 10 times as much in the same amount of time. Um, and it allowed us to write code once and have it work on every platform. Um, but under Guido's leadership, Python has become a lot more than just a programming language. It's created this rich ecosystem, and Python's found its way into everything from astrophysics to bioinformatics uh, to physics and a lot more than that. Um, and it's supported by an open source community of hundreds of thousands of people who have been empowered by what Guido's built. And now Guido has, uh, he continues to lead that community in the development of Python, um, but he has just about the coolest title you could possibly have in tech, uh, the BDFL, which stands for the Benevolent, Benevolent Dictator for Life. <laughs> I actually went to my board of directors and I was like, you know, I, I have some idea, like, So I, they didn't like that proposal, so it was rejected. Um, but uh, to, to pay tribute to the BDFL, we've got a little video for you. I was into somewhat subversive uh, TV shows and so Monty Python was one of those that I enjoyed watching. If you name it Python, it could arguably be named after a snake. I named it after Monty Python, but I sort of, I, I, I took it from Monty Python and it was like easy to type, not too many letters, not too many consonants next to each other easy to pronounce. My original idea was for Python to be sort of in between shell scripts and C programming. I had this vision of people, sort of kids learning, learning Python in school, which at the time looked pretty far-fetched because there weren't even that many computers in most schools. You can show someone here are the basics of Python, and if they know a bit of programming in another language, they'll see, oh wow, this is very simple, this is very easy, I can understand this already. But if you teach them Python instead of Pascal, you can sort of, they can focus more on, on that learning experience and less on where the semicolons do or don't go. The sort of the areas where Python is used most is on the one hand sort of web application development tooling, like the, the, the internal tooling we use at Google. There's a lot of that in Dropbox too, and sort of, again, Facebook. Instagram, uh, the Instagram service is written in Python. There are many other ways that Python is used where it's either an alternative to Java or Go, or it's a tool all by itself. Scientists use it to drive incredibly powerful libraries. That, that world has grown bigger and bigger and now we have like a lot of data science happening in Python. The fact that Python is easily extensible with code written in other languages. So Python is a great glue language. I cannot emphasize enough that uh, the community did it. It is such a great place. There are so many people contributing. And yes, we also argue. I learned so much from just listening to other people explain why a certain thing cannot work or why we should do a certain other thing. And I enjoy the debate. And I'm very happy that the community takes care of all these things that I couldn't possibly do all by myself. I think my role is mostly that of a mentor. So it's uh, no exaggeration to say that the world would be a very different place without Guido. And as, as you can tell, he'd be 
the last person to tell you that. Uh, he's one of the most humble and grounded people I know. Um, and I'm proud to call him my colleague, my mentor, uh, and my friend. And so with that, now it is my pleasure to present Guido Van Rossum with the 2018 Computer History Museum Fellow Award for the creation and evolution of the Python programming language and for the leadership of its community. So please join me in welcoming Guido to the stage. Okay, thank you. That, that was like heartwarming. <laughs> <coughs> 28 years ago, I did not expect my little creation would spread around the world this way. I just wanted to be a more productive programmer. Turns out there are a lot of programmers everywhere with that same desire. <laughs> lucky for them, I made Python open source and shared it with the world. And lucky for me, the world gave back. And together, we've made Python successful. There are now many great communities of Python users focused on open source packages and frameworks spreading the world the word, and helping each other. <clears throat> really, Python's superpower is that it spans such a wide range. It's a great first language, and it starts with you as your career develops. It's a scripting language. It's a glue language. It's a prototyping language. It's a production language. To some people, it's already a legacy language. <laughs> For example, as Drew mentioned, the first Dropbox prototype was written in Python. And in 10 years, that little Python program has grown to millions of lines of code today, syncing files for hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions, I should say, of users. But for me, the biggest reward has always been the people in the Python community. 24 years ago, we had a first modest Python workshop with about 20 attendees in Maryland. It was a life-changing event for me, and I'm still friends with some of those folks. And these days, there are hundreds of Python gatherings on six continents, as they say. And in about a week, I'm off to the annual United States Python conference, PyCon US, and I will meet thousands of people there. And it just still amazes me every time that I get to that event. And because you all want to move on to the next part of the program. I'm just going to finish saying again that I'm super happy with this award. Thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for all three of the fellows. Tonight. And at this point, other than acknowledging Intuit one more time, uh, I, I'd like, to, I'd like to move us all on to desserts, coffee, and for those who like cigars, there is a cigar bar. So thank you all for coming. Congratulations to all the fellows. We hope to see you again next year. Thanks so much.